My name is Alfie Vick. I'm faculty here at the University of Georgia College of Environment and Design. And I uh, want to welcome you all to the 2019 Eleanor Ferguson Vincent uh, Lecture. This lecture series um, is one that we've been holding since 1970 when the fund was established in honor of Eleanor Ferguson Vincent, who was a charter member of the Ladies Garden Club of Georgia, uh, which was founded in 1891 and happens to be the first garden club founded in the United States. And so we appreciate that legacy. And um, the fund was established in 1970 to bring in outstanding lecturers in landscape architecture and environmental design. And so I'm, I'm pleased to be here to uh, introduce our outstanding speaker today, who's Keith Bowers. Um, Keith has been at the forefront of um, applied ecology and conservation and sustainable design for over 30 years. Um, he's the founder and president of Biohabitats, a firm that got its start in Maryland and now has expanded to many offices throughout the United States and has done work um, throughout the United States on hundreds of projects when we're starting to see more of those projects here in the southeast and we're really uh, um, happy to, to see their work um, making a footprint here uh, in Georgia in particular and I think we'll hear about some of that tonight. Um, but their work and biohabitats is uh, multidisciplinary and I think their firm and Keith in particular in leading this firm has really been a, a beacon for um, showing how landscape architecture and ecology and engineering and wetland science and hydrology are all integrated and can be applied in, in really effective and, and beautiful ways. Um, if you're wondering what some of the alphabet after Keith's name is, uh, there he's a <laughs> fellow in the American Society of Landscape Architects, a registered landscape architect, and also a professional wetland scientist. Um, he serves on the, the board of the McCarg Center at the University of Pennsylvania and has also served for many years, um, or did serve for many years, on the board of the Society for Ecological Restoration. And really their work over the last 30 years has helped to uh, you know, uh, establish what the field of applied ecological restoration is. Um, so we're, we're really happy to have him here today. And help me welcome Keith to Great. Keith. Thanks, Alfie. So everybody can hear me. I, I can use a microphone, but I'd rather not if you all can hear me fine. That, that's great. Good. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to come by this afternoon. I'm really happy and excited to share some of the work and projects and challenges and, and trends that we see out there in uh, applied ecology and landscape architecture as it relates to ecological restoration and conservation planning and landscape ecology. Uh, as Alfie said, I started this company about 35 years ago, right out of school. Uh, and at the time, the whole idea or the whole discipline of restoration ecology was just beginning to take place. Uh, so really, I sort of had to, in some ways, make it up as I went along, but then I at least had the smarts enough to know that I needed to hire ecologists and biologists and geomorphologists and soil scientists and foresters. And so really my first dozen, dozen and a half <coughs> hires as part of this firm I was building came from the sciences. Uh, and I used my background in landscape architecture to try to figure out how to apply that science back to the landscape and begin thinking about restoration. So one of the things that I like to do is kind of get grounded in a place. And I'm from Baltimore. That's where I uh, was raised, grew up, started the company there. Um, and about 10 years ago, my wife, who's from South Carolina, from Greenville, said, we're going back south and we're moving to South Carolina. So we moved to Charleston, uh, South Carolina. So I've been living there for the last 10 years and absolutely love it. But it's really. Um, I've tried to find a way to reconnect with that area of the country because I wasn't, I, I wasn't, I, I was raised on the Chesapeake Bay and, and that whole, which is absolutely beautiful in its own, own way as well. Um, so I've gotten to know the coastal areas quite well down here and have been spending more and more time. That first photograph you saw was actually my wife. We were out in the Ace Basin a couple weeks ago down there kayaking. And for those of you that have never been to the Ace Basin just south of Charleston, um, I'd highly encourage you to go. It's a 250,000 acre conservation 
wilderness area. Um, and it doesn't get much better than that. And so finding ways to conserve more of that type of land, especially w near rapidly growing urban areas, I think is really important. But one of the things that I love about Charleston and I've learned is, um, you know, obviously dolphins are, are pretty prolific polar around the Charleston area. And does anybody know what this dolphin's doing here? Some of you may. Lizard crabs? Huh? Lizard crabs? Yeah, well, it's, it's called <laughs> strand feeding. And so what these dolphins have learned to do is they've worked, you can see the fins of other dolphins here. They've learned how to corral fish and force them against the mud flats at low tide. And then one of the dolphins goes up and breaches itself on the mud flat and opens its mouth and the other dolphins push all the fish toward it and it feeds. And then that dolphin goes off and then they circle around and another dolphin goes up and does this. And what's really fascinating about this is that there's only two populations in the whole world of dolphins that exhibit this type of behavior, right? So when we talk about biodiversity and we talk about species and, and, and um, you know, we think about that from a, a sort of local standpoint, we also need to be thinking about it from a global standpoint, but um, it's really amazing that once you get to, you know, know and understand what's going on locally with some of these species, it's pretty amazing the behaviors they exhibit and how unique and special they all are. Um, and so I've, I've seen these dolphins actually do this. It's kind of a rare um, occurrence, but um, What's also interesting is they do this um, from just south of uh, Savannah, Georgia, up to approximately like Myrtle Beach, Wilmington area. And they also do this in New Zealand. Um, a population in New Zealand they found exhibits this behavior. And what's also interesting is that the population of dolphins in the coastal area is actually divided in two. There's a population that just stays in the inland bays and the uh, um, uh, breaches that go out to the ocean. And then there's another population that spends their whole life just out in the ocean right offshore. And what they've also been able to determine is they don't really mix. They don't come in, you know, the, the, those different populations don't really mix. So it's the ones that are in these inland bays have learned this behavior and the other population hasn't. Um, so it's just absolutely fascinating to think about things like that. I had a couple people that really influenced me, and as Alfie mentioned, um, I, was luck I was fortunate enough to be asked to be on the board of the Ian McCarg Center, which is at the University of Pennsylvania. For those of you that may not know Ian McCarg, he was a professor there back in the 60s and 70s, and we consider him sort of the landscape architect who brought ecology to landscape architecture in a way that hadn't been done for, cent or for decades. And Ian McCarg was really fond of developing this whole idea of overlaying maps, of overlaying, say, geology and soils and vegetation cover before there was ever GIS, right? He was doing this on maps and overlaying them to try to determine where we could develop land in the you know, uh, least impactful way and how can we protect resources. And he wrote a book, Design with Nature, which became sort of the Bible, which is, you know, everybody in landscape architecture, hopefully you know this book and you know the teachings of Ian McCarg. And that book is going to be, it's 50 years old this year. Um, and so the University of Pennsylvania is doing a big celebration in June uh, at UPenn to celebrate the legacy of Ian McCarg. But Ian McCarg also did a plan for what's called the valleys, and the valleys are Greenspring Valley and Worthington Valley, and I grew up right next to Greenspring Valley. And so I sort of found out about Ian McCarg as I started getting interested in landscape architecture, and that really, I think, helped shape sort of, uh, um, sort of my, where my likes and, and what I really wanted to try to do with a degree in landscape architecture. Another big mentor of mine is a, a gentleman, Dr. Edgar Garbish. And Dr. Garbish was a professor up at the University of Mi Michigan, took a sabbatical and went down to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and basically fell in love with the idea of restoring tidal wetlands along the Chesapeake Bay. And this was again back in the 70s when restoration and the whole field of ecological restoration still wasn't really developed. 
but he decided he was going to learn how to propagate, in this case, mostly Spartina alterna flora, the smooth cord grass, and some other uh, Spartina varieties, and uh, black needle rush, and how to begin restoring wetlands along the Chesapeake Bay. And nobody else in the country was even thinking about doing something like that. We were still hell-bent on filling wetlands all over the place, right? Uh, and I found out about him, and I went down and visited him, I think, in my either freshman or sophomore year in college and thought, wow, this is really cool. Somebody is out there and they're ac actually looking at how to piece back together this ecological system, in this case, these tidal estuarine marshes, in a way to bring back sort of the health of the Chesapeake Bay. And I thought, that's really what I want to do. But I started looking around and there was, again, no programs in, in this at all. So. I ended up finishing out and getting my degree in landscape architecture, but most of my classwork and most of what I tried to emphasize was looking at ecology as I was going through that program there. And then I think, you know, over the years, what's happened is when we first started practicing ecological restoration back, back in the early 80s, when I started practicing, it was pretty simple because the whole idea of climate change wasn't really around. Um, the idea of these sort of planetary impacts that we were having was just beginning to be exposed. But for us, back then, restoration meant going back in time and looking at how an ecosystem evolved at, at a, before it was impacted, say, by people, and you're trying to sit there and figure out how to restore that ecosystem maybe back to a time period before uh, it was impacted. Uh, and <clears throat> that seemed kind of, I mean, it was complex and it still is very complex, but over the years, what's happened is, is we found out about climate change. We found out about, in this case, um, what we call these trophic cascades where we remove keystone species like wolves. And when we remove those keystone species, then all of a sudden you have this cascading effect of the species that they preyed on balloons up, and then those species begin to eat. In this case, here, all the aspen, all the aspen begin to disappear. Then, then all these cascades begin to happen. And you think about the legacy over time of these landscapes, like extirpating the wolf in the eastern United States. We're still dealing with that legacy out in these landscapes right now. I mean, we're just beginning to understand how these trophic cascades are working. So it makes thinking about uh, restoration all the more complex, right? And now, you know, many scientists are saying we're entering this sixth great um, uh, uh, mass extinction right now where a lot of these species are beginning to go extinct and we think about what are the cascading effects that that's going to have on our ecosystems as we move forward. Um, many that we just, just don't understand. We don't understand yet the connection, connections and relationships of what's going on out there, which goes back to the whole idea of taking sort of a precautionary approach to how we're impacting the landscape. And then, of course, climate change, right? That we're already, through modeling, beginning to predict what may happen to certain species as climate begins to shift over, over time, over the next 100 years. And we still are learning a lot about that. We're, you know, hopefully we're getting smarter in some of our models here but it's still just a modeling exercise. And what we found is really going back and looking at ecosystems as they exist now or as they, ex as they existed before they were impacted is really the only analog or only example that we have. And we need to still continue to learn from that as best we can as these landscapes and these ecosystems begin to shift into the future. So it makes it, again, much more complex when we begin thinking about ecological restoration. And then this was just published, what, a couple of days or a couple of weeks ago about how the world's insects are, are heading down a path to extinction, right? Um, and that's pretty sobering, too, when you think about how insects really are part of the building block of these ecosystems. In fact, E.O. Wilson, the biologist from Harvard, said, all the, if all of mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed. 10,000 years ago, if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos, right? So that's pretty sobering to think about. So when we think about what drives us at biohabitats, it's to us 
it's really, it's, it's one thing, it's all about biodiversity. That to us, biodiversity is sort of the canary in the coal mine, right? That if we're really working to protect, enhance, conserve, restore biodiversity, then all those other ecological functions and processes um, will fall underneath that. But the other thing that's really affected our, pro our, our practice in probably the last uh, 10 years or so is social and environmental justice issues. And that's becoming more and more a part of almost all the projects that we're working on now. So in a sense, the whole field of restoration ecology, conservation biology, landscape ecology, while these fields are fairly new, restoration ecology probably being one of the newest of those fields, we're still dealing with all these things that we're trying to grasp or wrap our heads around and learn from in terms of how we work on different sites, right? And so there's this whole idea that, you know, when you're doing, quote, restoration, are you really looking back to historical conditions or are you thinking of a novel landscape, a landscape where so certain soils or certain ecological processes are coming together where we don't have never seen that happen before on Earth? And how do we deal with that? How do we manage it? How do we begin to understand it, its relationships? Um, to all of biodiversity, and that gets pretty complex. And I would say that we're still all learning. You know, we don't have all the answers. None of our projects are perfect. Um, we always are looking to improve on that and figure out where we want to go. And in fact, um, one of uh, a soil scientists over in, in the UK, a good friend of mine, Jim Harris, you know, he kind of, he said he was in Ireland one day and he stopped to ask an Irishman, how do I get I don't know, to some point, and the Irishman turned around and said, well, I wouldn't start from here if I were you, <laughs> right? And I, I think that I feel that way in, in a lot of the restoration projects that we do. It's like, I don't know if I really want to start from here, but I guess I have to. Um, and it's unfortunate, but that's what we're left in trying to do. So what I thought I'd do is I'll, I'm going to take you through some of the different types of projects that we work on across the United States. Some I'll, I'll go into a little bit more depth. Other, others will be quick little vignettes just to give you an idea of the sort of vast array of different projects and clients and uh, um, areas, ecosystems that we work in. And if any of you have any questions along the way or, or uh, um, you know, any observations, please feel free to just chime in there. So the first place I'm going to take you is out to uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, any of you from Portland, know Portland? Portlandia, have you ever watched Portlandia? <laughs> yeah, it's just like that. Uh, and we were actually hired here by one of the uh, utilities, the wastewater utilities out in Portland, Oregon called Clean Water Services and they service all of the sort of west, northwest suburbs of Portland. And they were looking for a way of doing three things. One, they wanted to find a more natural way of treating some of their wastewater. Two, they wanted to remove um, and lower the nitrogen levels in the water affluent that they were discharging from their primary and secondary treatment plant. And third, and most importantly, they had to drop the temperature of the water because salmon are a really big deal out in the Pacific Northwest. And like many trout and salmon, uh, they need cool water, cold water. And what was happening is that this wastewater treatment plant during the summertime, the discharge from the plant was too warm and they couldn't release it back into, in this case, the Tualatin River. And what they had to do was pipe it 50 some miles away to another treatment plant that had the capacity to store that water long enough to drop the temperature before it could be discharged in a lower part of the river, or lower, lower part of the watershed where the temperature regime was a little bit higher. So they were figuring out, well, how can we, how can we work with what we have and, and work with nature to try to uh, treat the wastewater to some degree, lower nitrogen levels and lower temperature there. So they had looked at, um, some more engineering approaches. These are the lagoons that they have out there. And what they were doing is releasing water to these lagoons, perfectly engineered, straight lined, you know, basins out there that sit in the floodplain of the Tualatin River. And over time they were, they were saying, you know, these lagoons aren't really doing what we need them to do. Maybe we need to go back and rethink this whole thing from a landscape perspective 
and still make sure that we get uh, those goals met. And so they ended up hiring us to come in there and help them rethink the whole idea of, of natural wastewater treatment and how could we combine that with enhancing the floodplain of the Tualatin River in terms of wetlands and how could we still make this, this, this is an area uh, just happens to be over to a flyway out there and so the birders in the community even in this condition love to go out there and do some birding because they got um, a lot of the shorebirds and migratory waterfowl coming in at different times of the year so we were charged with not only doing all those other things but making sure that we were uh, developing good bird habitat in here. So this is just, you can see the Tualatin River on the bottom, the blue thread there, the wastewater treatment plants all the way up at the top. Those are those big lagoons, those ponds, one, two, and three in there. And uh, the first thing that we did, and we do these, this on a lot of projects, is we look at what focal, you know, we kind of identify what focal species we're trying to design for. Because I think it's one thing for landscape architects, and I can bash on landscape architects because I'm one of them. <laughs> and I think it's one thing where they say, well, we're going to go out and create this green space for habitat, but not really know what habitat you're actually creating for. And in some cases, whether you're creating a genetic sink for that habitat that's there because it's isolated, right? So uh, that's where I think we bring in a lot of the science and ecology is where we pick these species that act as sort of umbrella species. In other words, if you can design habitat for them, you're designing habitat for a whole host of other species that are, depend on those species or relate to those species. So that's one of the first things that we do is try to identify some of these key focal species that we want to begin to design for. The other thing that we do in a lot of our restoration projects is we go out to reference sites. So we visited a whole bunch of the natural or existing wetlands along the Tualatin River to collect a whole host of data, data including geomorphic data, in other words, the shape of these wetland basins, the hydrology and hydraulics, how water flows through these systems. We look at plant communities and their relationship to hydro periods and their relationship to the different soils. Um, and we try to get as much information as we can from these reference systems and try to extract that back to apply to the designs that we're working on. So in this case, this just shows some of the um, reference site data that we're collecting. We do probably as much work analyzing and inventory and reference sites as we do on the sites that we're actually working on because of how important that is. Um, and, and again, that's really the only place where we can, oops, I don't know what happened there. The only place where we can um, oh, learn from that. So what we did is we came up with a concept design of taking out those three basins and really flowing water through here. And one of the things that you don't see, I mean, you don't see all the modeling, all the hydrology and hydraulic modeling that went into this. You don't see uh, all the um, thought about how water flows through here, the depths of these channels in terms of, and the contact of soil to vegetation to lower the nitrogen levels, to lower the uh, temperature levels. But that's all engineered in, and that's all part of this. So a lot of our projects take a lot of engineering as well as the ecology and science on these to try to make them work. The other thing we had to do here is that this whole area gets flooded about once every two years from the Tualatin River. The floods go all the way up, so the floods wash over this whole area. And so we had to also look at this from sort of a resiliency standpoint to make sure that whatever we designed here is going to withstand some of those floods there. Um, so, you know, what we need to do is then begin modeling this as if it all flooded, what's going to happen through here. So we did all that work um, and we came up with a system now that would regulate and take the flow through this marsh habitat and back out and then they'd be able to release it directly to the Tualatin River. So they're actually saving hundreds, if not millions of dollars. Um, by restoring this landscape and now they're able to discharge that secondary affluent into this system before it goes into the Tualatin River. So we look at, in this case, modeling temperature to make sure we get the temperature reductions that we want to do in here. Um, and we also developed a whole uh, uh, treatment wetlands in terms of what needed to be done. So 90 acre footprint, 
250,000 uh, cubic yards of earthwork. We had 15 different hydraulic control structures embedded into this system. So again, it's sort of highly engineered to where they push water through and how long they need to retain it. And then, you know, over, over three quarters of a million plants, I don't know who estimated the billions of seed, but um, a lot of seed, again, using sort of native plants. So I'll just take you through a couple pictures of this in terms of going back through there and regrading uh, this site through here. These are some of the control structures that were embedded in there. And what we did is we faced all those with wood and logs so you don't even see the concrete. They become embedded in there, but they are controlling the water flow through this system. We also went in and we added a lot of standing snags and woody debris to the bottom here. We had to anchor all this down because we didn't want all this floating away and causing a hazard during flood events. Um, so we got pretty serious about how to anchor these down into the ground so they won't move, but it creates great wildlife habitat. So dead wood, these snags, uh, brush piles, anytime you can get wood and carbon back into this system, um, that's a really good thing. So fortunately, Clean Water Services allowed us to go in and do this type of work in these systems. And then we went out and planted uh, this with, you know, those plants and seeds. We also had a sort of uh, kickoff ceremony and we gave everybody uh, mud balls with the native seed in the mud balls and they all got to throw it out there to be a part of the whole planting exercise there. So they had a lot of fun doing that. You can see some of the uh, standing snags that are back there in the background. And then, you know, over the years, this is slowly, um, the vegetation in here, the marsh has slowly developed um, into a system that looks like um, this as it's coming in. We've had to manage for some invasive species, which is always um, a threat and something that we always take into consideration what some of those areas look like. And then this, we had a photographer out there last year that shot this shot, which I thought was pretty amazing. Um, of some of the waterfowl coming through and uh, um, how that vegetation's just grown up and now all that affluent goes through this wetland into the Tualatin River. So it's been a great success and one way we know it's a great success is that there's, um, we also developed a monitoring framework. So they're out there monitoring and looking at things like vegetation diversity, macroinvertebrates, the water quality obviously, um, there's a lot, Audubon's out there doing a lot of bird surveys and just the diversity of wildlife that we have in there, which you think is really important. And the birding community absolutely loves this. They're out there all the time. They, this is a, a go-to place for the surrounding area to do birding. Um, and what we tried to do too when we did that design is we specifically put in islands and we even got specific about the, how far or how much landing space certain uh, waterfowl need to land in water and take off and make sure that we had enough open water to allow them uh, to do that in certain areas. Um, and what's been really good is that a couple things. One is all the birding that's taken place, they now have a birds and brew festival out there, which is great for the community. Um, but they've taken the affluent from the plant and they're making fertilizer and that fertilizer is then being used from the by the community back into the community, which um, I think is great. And then a lot of volunteers out there now. Um, so this has become a real asset to the community, not just from an ecological standpoint, but from a sort of social and cultural perspective. So um, I'll take you now all the way across country to New York, New York City. Anybody grow up in New York City, know the area? Yeah, good. So this is Jamaica Bay, which sits you know, just east of the city. And many of you may know Jamaica Bay because you might have flown into JFK Airport at some point in time, which is on fill, filled completely in. So that whole airport is uh, fill on Jamaica Bay. That's what Jamaica Bay used to look like back in 1903. Basically what you might expect of sort of a tidal wetland coastal system. This is what it looks like in 2006, much of it was filled, about a third of the bay was filled in around the edges. Um, a good portion of it was dredged for these uh, canals for boats to go up and through. Uh, and so what happened over time is it's changed the whole dynamics of that bay system. So 
the way sediment used to be transported through this system, the way water flowed in and out of this system, the diversity of wildlife is all completely changed and impacted over the course of about 100 years here. Uh, this is a uh, fish and wildlife have a national refuge out here. It's also part of a national park system. And it also uh, is basically the uh, area that drains a good portion of Queens and other parts of the city into the bay. So from a water quality perspective, it's really hurting. So we were asked uh, about 10 years ago to come in and look at developing a Jamaica Bay, uh, in this case, a Jamaica Bay watershed management plan of how can they manage the bay and manage the watershed that's draining to the bay in a way where they can begin reversing some of the impacts that have had on the bay. So the first thing we did is we built this model here, and I won't bore you with it all, but you know, we basically looked at the causes, the stressors, the effects, the ecosystem responses to those stressors, and on and on. This model actually goes on and on. But it really began to give us a good understanding, um, or at least a basic understanding, of what was happening in the Bay, what things could you do that would have sort of the most benefit, right? What, what is sort of like the flywheel effect. If you can begin starting that, then what will take off over the long term? And so we worked on this um, quite extensively, but out of this came five pilot projects that we decided to test, or actually we didn't, DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection in New York City, decided to test in Jamaica Bay. One was doing an eelgrass restoration, so that's that submerged aquatic vegetation, or in our lingo we call it SAVs, in the bay, those underwater grasses. Two, to reintroduce oysters to the bay, because we know how valuable oysters are. They're, they're like a keystone species, like the wolf is on land. Oysters actually are a keystone species in water. Um, and so we wanted to try to introduce oyster reefs back to the bay. Third, the idea of using rib mussels to filter water that's coming down the tributaries and out the storm drains. Um, and use sort of a living systems or a living engineering approach to treating that water. Uh, four, to do what I'll, the, uh, I'll call algal turf scrubbers, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. And five, the idea that if we can put out floating wetlands in some of the bay to absorb some of the energy that's hitting these marshes that are left out there and reduce the erosion and accrete sediment behind them, then maybe we can slow down the rate of degradation of some of these. And just real quickly, I'll go through. Some of these are a success and some were a failure. So the SAVs, we went out there in snorkeling gear and um, went and planted these SAVs out in the water. And what we found and what we have learned from the Chesapeake Bay, so we weren't doing this totally ignorant of what we thought might happen. But SAVs need clear water so sunlight can penetrate down to the bottom so these grasses can grow. And when you have very turbid water or you have high turbidity, and a lot of times these grasses won't, won't flourish. And sure enough, Jamaica Bay had enough turbidity in it, um, had too much sediment moving around in it. it it's turned more from a sand-dominated system to a muck-dominated system, so that gets uh, churned up rather easily. And basically all our SAVs fail over a course of a couple, two or three years we're out there monitoring. Um, so we decided, you know, obviously that's not going to work until we can improve the water quality, the clarity of the water. We know, we think from a sediment standpoint, that's not the controlling factor, but the turbidity is. And so that really needs to change before the SAVs will really take off. Um, we did the oyster restoration, so we worked on, on these oyster castles. They're just concrete balls that we attached oyster spat to and put them in the bay and we did two types. One we put directly on the bottom of the bay and one we lifted them up and had them in the middle of the water column. And again what happened is the ones in the middle of the water column are still there. They're, they have self-sustaining oysters on them and it's one of the only areas in metropolitan New York right now that has a self-sustaining oyster population still going on. The ones on the bottom of the bay, too much silt and they got buried and covered over and they didn't work well so we knew that we had to elevate them. So a lot of what we do in, in restoration is what we call adaptive management, right? We don't know necessarily all the answers and we have to figure out, we have to try different things based on different hypotheses and see what will work or what won't work. So now the idea is how can we scale this up to a much bigger scale where 
we can get enough reefs out there that oysters will begin to have an impact on water quality and, and habitat as well. Um, these uh, mussel, these are the mussel cages that we developed and the idea is to kind of put this screen up on some of these tributaries and attach um, the rib mussels to. So rib mussels, uh, um, there have been uh, uh, research done on how well they do filter water. They were working here. They completely um, uh, did well on all these screens. The problem here is that we just don't have enough good data to statistically say that these mussels were the, were, made that much of a significant difference because there's so much noise in, in terms of the water flowing through here and how water moves back and forth in these tidal areas. And um, while we suspect the mussels will be a great sort of ecological engineering approach to this, um, there wasn't enough scientific data to say we need to go forward with that. Uh, this is a uh, algal turf scrubber. So you see this long black, um, looks like sort of a runway on the left side. And the whole idea here is that a lot of these uh, water bodies like Jamaica Bay are filled with nutrients, right? Mostly nitrogen, phosphorus, and we all know about algae blooms in the summertime when the water gets heated up and the algae start feeding on all the nutrients and then you have the algae that dies out which then affects the dissolved oxygen in these lakes and water bodies which then you have fish kills and, and all kinds of other impacts. And so this idea which was actually developed down in Florida many years ago is the idea that you can pump water out, run it down this runway the algae will grow on this runway. You scrape the algae off and the rest of the clean water that's um, uh, minus all the nutrients goes back into the bay. And so we wanted to kind of test this out as a pilot project to see how it worked in Jamaica Bay. And sure enough, we grew a lot of algae and we worked with the University of Arkansas to turn it into to biofuel. Um, and just to show that there could be a byproduct of this algae. And so we've worked with DEP of scaling this up on a really massive scale. That what if you had acres and acres, hundreds of acres of these algal turf scrubbers and that you could be pumping water up and treating that water and discharging it back into the bay. So it's feasible. You know, with, with all these systems, we're working at the very end of the pipe. We're working in the bay when really what we need to be doing is working up in the watershed to prevent all that all those nutrients from getting in the water in the first place. But this is one, one technique that could be used to try to do that. So we've actually been working with uh, Maryland Port Authority and we've been working um, with New York and Philadelphia on ways to scale up some systems like this from an ecological engineering perspective to begin handling some of the nutrients in the bay. And then lastly, this is those floating wetlands that I was talking about. So we worked with in fact, there's a floating wetland um, manufacturer in, a, in, um, in Augusta, Georgia, who we work with that does these floating wetlands. And we launch these floating wetlands out there to try again to look and see if we can buffer. You can see up that top picture of the erosion that's taking place on the marshes that are left there. Um, and we launched that out there. And actually what we found, we went back and did all kinds of surveys on the islands and found that it was accreting sediment and it was buffering those, and it would be a great idea. The problem was a lot of these broke up <laughs> um, through storm events and through boat wakes, and we just didn't have the right configuration um, of these. So we've gone, so we, now we've developed a whole new type of floating wetland that could withstand those kinds of conditions. But again, these pilot projects really do a lot in telling us what will work and what won't work out there. Um, so this could be another effective way. Um, on those floating wetlands, we've had night heron um, nest on them. We've got all kinds of eels. We've got blue crabs that climb up there, um, all kinds of waterfowl. So these floating wetlands actually provide some really great habitat, plus they're working to um, preserve some of that. New York Times even came out and did a, did a story on this um, before, before some of them broke apart, fortunately. <laughs> Um, but it's still, again, you know, a lot of this is um, pilot studies there. And what that's really led us to in New York City is, you know, how can we find, uh, how can we use this idea of green infrastructure up in the city to begin treating water quality at its source instead of down in Jamaica Bay or any of the other tributaries there. And one interesting fact about New York City that 
there's hardly any room on the street or on the sidewalks to dig and put in any type of bioretention or rain garden or anything like that because you're going to hit utilities, you're going to hit the subway, you're going to hit somebody's trash vault, you're going to hit all kinds of things, right? So the number one place that you can do green infrastructure is on rooftops. That if you think that every roof has to be, will probably be changed over in the next 50 to 75 years at most, that if you can convert every rooftop in New York City to a green roof that could store water and manage water from a water quality standpoint, then you could go to a long way in solving their water quality issues in New York City. So it's just, they're now beginning to think about legislation in New York that when you have to repair your roof, you have to look at putting in a green roof um, to handle this kind of problem. So it's, it's pretty interesting to think about it from that standpoint. So now, how am I doing on time? I'm doing, right? Ooh, not much. Um, yeah, so this, this project was featured in Landscape Architecture, and we've presented this a couple times at the ASLA. This is down in Texas. This is Galveston Island. And uh, this is Galveston Island State Park. You can see development down here um, to the west, development to the east. You see that yellow line is the major road that services the whole island. This is a barrier island off the coast of Texas. This is the Gulf of Mexico. That's Galveston Bay back there. You see all those little uh, um, checkerboard pattern up there in the bay? That was an attempt a long time, not a long time, well, maybe about 20 years ago to begin restoring wetlands in Galveston Bay. And the idea behind this attempt, which I found kind of fascinating, was let's create a box of sediment. Let's not fill in the box. Let's let nature fill in the box by having the tides roll over and go back and the sediment accretes inside. So in some ways, we'll jumpstart restoration, but we'll let nature take over. And what happened in this case is nature didn't decide to do that, that um, the land is subsiding there. Not only are they getting sea level rise, but the land is subsiding. And these subsided enough where the flows in and out, the flows out were just as powerful as the flows in, so sediment wasn't accreting in there, and so it never happened, right? So again, another idea of piloting something to try to see if they can jumpstart the system from a restoration standpoint, but it didn't quite work that well. So this was Galveston uh, Island State Park, the highest grossing revenue park in the state of Texas, um, because everybody loved to go to the beach, had all these campgrounds down there, you can see these are probably out of the 1960s, I guess. Um, these, these campground pavilion structures, they had campgrounds on the beach or next to the beach. They had campgrounds back in the back parts of the marsh in, in the island. Um, and this was after Hurricane Ike came through and completely devastated the whole park. Um, all the infrastructure in the park was completely ripped up and gone. So Texas Parks and Wildlife said, you know, this park's really important for us. We want to redevelop it, but we want to do it in a way where we're thinking about sea level rise. We're thinking about climate change. We're thinking about sort of resiliency, although they never used that term 15 years ago. That seems to be the term to use today. And how do we develop this park in a way where we can work with these systems instead of working against them? So we were brought in as part of a team studio outside out of Dallas, Texas, was the landscape architect, and they were brought in to do a, a master plan. And we were brought in as their sort of ecological consultant to begin looking at the different habitats. We, they asked us to model sea level rise here, um, taking into account land subsidence, taking into account sea level, taking into account accretion rates. Uh, looking at storm surges, how that might affect the island over time, uh, and doing a model on that, and then thinking about what does conservation and restoration look, at, look like in the next 30 to 50 years based on the dynamics that's going on out here. And it's actually a, a really beautiful site. These are all coastal prairies out here. Um, what's a bit deceiving is, is that back in the early 1900s, um, this was all cattle ran all over this island um, because this was great habitat to put cattle on because you didn't have to put fences up. Um, and cattle could just run throughout the island. So a lot of these were cattle farms uh, before uh, tourists came down here. And so some of the prairies here have reverted back to some native vegetation, but there's some invasives in there, or some exotic vegetation in there as well. 
But we, what we did is we went in and did a complete characterization of the whole island from the Gulf all the way over to Galveston Bay to get a really good handle on the different types of plant communities are out there, the groundwater levels, uh, the soils, and how that all worked together there. We also took a step back, and we do this on many of our projects, where we begin to look at landscape ecology issues, just being on a migratory flyway, how species move in and out of this site is really important for us because, again, we don't want to create this isolated patch. We want to understand how it either acts either directly connected to other ecosystems or other patches or corridors or how it is indirectly connected as maybe like a stepping stone to, other, to how species move across the landscape. Um, but we went through all the, all the modeling here and basically at different time frames here in the next 50 years, we looked at what the modeling results were, gonna, were saying about sea level rise. We looked at accretion rates. We looked at subsidence rates and, and, and did all that. And sort of what we did is we went back to the master planning team and said, okay, how do you take all that information and visualize it, right? And so this is the bay as it existed in 2010. And what we said was, well, based on different modeling scenarios, this is what it would look like in 2060, in 50 years, right? So you go from this to this. And if you keep your eye on the lower, if you look at the Gulf of Mexico down here on the lower part of the picture and that major road going through, and you sit there at 2010, and oops, at 2010, and this is what it's gonna look like in 2060, then all of a sudden the Gulf of Mexico is right up against that road and the beach has migrated back up, right? Um, and so, as planners, we wanted to make sure that whatever we were planning for this site took into account uh, at least these predictions that we were beginning to make here. Whether these predictions, you know, even if they're 50% accurate, um, which a lot of friends of mine like to say all statistics are 50% accurate 50% of the time, right? Um, then still, we're still trying, you know, to design um, a system here. And, and the same thing with habitat. We did the same thing with uh, plant communities. Here's what the plant communities consist of in 2010 based on some of this modeling. Here's potentially what they might be in 2060. So we're losing some plant communities altogether. Others are shrinking or others are shifting across the landscape. So how do you interpret that landscape over time if you're the parks department and you're having people visit this park and camping here and that type of thing? And, and so this is just one little sort of vignette of one of the ideas is that you know, the spine of this road system through this area here would be placed on high enough ground that it's not going to be necessarily affected by sea level rise, but maybe some of these camping pods over time are going to go from being on land to being out in the water over time. So do you design them or build them in such a way where they can adapt to that, right? So just begin thinking about how infrastructure might be planned differently based on sea level rise. And then we interacted with the uh, uh, interpretive uh, rangers and other people in the parks department to begin interpreting how that landscape's gonna shift over time as well. So instead of fighting, if they see some of these plant communities begin to shift or begin to uh, um, uh, minimize or become uh, less uh, uh, coverage, then maybe they don't wanna fight that. Maybe they wanna understand the dynamics of what's going on there and shift their restoration or their conservation strategies accordingly. So now I'll take you inland real quick. And this was, this sort of has some ramifications of, uh, I guess, a, a couple of sites we went out to today, right? Where did we go? Over to uh, Lake Eric. Yeah, Lake Eric and looked at some of the streams, the stream system out there. And a lot of times we like to get our sort of analogs or examples from nature and beaver dams are a great example of you know, uh, how to create a system that has all kinds of ecological benefits, right? Um, but many of our systems look like this today, which we saw, in fact, um, today, a, you know, a stream system that looked exactly like this. And what we found over, you know, all this impervious surface, it cuts down into the landscape. You get these head cuts that come back up. Now all the floodwaters, instead of flooding out on the, on the floodplain and dissipating all their energy, they're trapped in here. It's just a uh, um, you know, a perpetual problem that happens. And we've lost that hydrologic connection back up to the floodplain and the landscape because of all this uncontrolled runoff coming off of uh, 
of hard surfaces like parking lots and buildings and roads and that type of thing. So what we've been doing is we've been working on this concept um, where we're going in and putting in some of these check dams. And these check dams, though, are built of certain materials. In this case, they're built of these big boulders to basically hold it in place. But they're filled, the core of these are filled with sand and wood chips because the idea is water infiltrates through here. They pick up the carbon in the wood. And that also helps from a biological perspective in these systems. It helps to regenerate some of that lost carbon in these systems. Because you imagine they're down, these, these channels are now down into the sea horizon and very little carbon's getting into the system. So in terms of the food web and the aquatic systems in there, um, they're getting starved from that. Uh, and what we try to do is lift the channel back up so the um, water has a chance to flood out over the floodplain. And so this gives you sort of an idea of once you start putting in these, how we can begin to rehydrate the floodplain. And then we go in and we do some planting in here, but we also find there's a lot of great seed bank that's already in the soil here. And this is what it looked like about two or three years later in there, right? So now it's this expansive sort of wetland system that doesn't necessarily have a defined channel through here, but those floodwaters can, can get up and go over the whole system buried logs in there, again, adding wood and habitat back to this system here. Um, and it's just a great, it's a fantastic habitat. And you get rid of all that erosion and all that sediment that's moving downstream. In this case, it was moving downstream into the Chesapeake Bay. And so you're solving for so many of the impacts that those head cuts in those channels have. Now, you have to have the ability to be able to reflood or rehydrate those floodplains. And in some areas we work, um, were prevented from lifting the channel back up and rehydrating the floodplain because then we're raising the 100 year floodplain elevation and if you have structures and property nearby um, you might have a problem doing that um, but in other cases some cases we take the whole floodplain down or we do a combination of excavating the floodplain and moving the channel back up to create that kind of condition yeah sorry Oh, no, not at all. Nope. Nope. So that just, that's just buried in there. And over time, you get enough wood back in the system that you don't have to worry about the wood in those check dams, right? Yeah. So even in this case, um, we didn't, this is a pitcher plant. We didn't plant this. This was in the seed bank and came up. Um, but it's just amazing, you know, if you begin to sort of jumpstart these systems and regenerate these systems, how it'll work. But we also go back, in this case, we, um, worked with the University of Maryland. And they went out and they studied these systems. And, and here they looked at discharge, red being before um, or upstream of what was happening. You get this really flashy hydrologic regime. You know, when it rains, it all comes off at once and the streams, stream level goes way up and then it crashes back down. The black is through the stream channel that we um, designed. So it flattens out that hydrograph. So again, that flood water is flattening now. We also looked at things like temperature in here. And again, the blue is upstream, the control. The red is the restored reach. So we're reducing the temperatures in the system here. And then they also began looking at um, or total suspended solids and phosphorus. And um, we also looked at nitrogen and began studying how these systems begin to remove or sequester uh, a lot of these nutrients that are in a lot of this urban runoff. Um, the last thing we did is we went back and said, okay, what does this cost? Uh, the project cost about $750,000, so it was quite expensive. But then we said, well, what kind of ecological benefits are we getting out of this? And kind of went back to the discipline of, of ecological economics and began looking at the values of these different systems and basically you know, while it costs $750,000, one could make an argument that we're actually creating $3.3 million of ecological function and benefit in this system here. So that cost ratio, benefit the cost ratio is pretty good, right? If we can begin valuing these ecological services that are being provided, then we can show that these can be pretty cost effective systems out here. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, how much time? Okay, we've got a couple of minutes. So 
So this was actually a really fun project. This is out on the Sandy River in Portland, Oregon. And we were, we didn't design this project. We do a lot of construction, so we uh, not only do the restoration design work, but we actually have crews and people that go out and do the actual implementation and construction. And a good portion of our work is design bill, where we will do the design and the construction, and other portions will do design and it has to be bid out, and other people do the restoration work, and in some cases will bid on projects that other designers do and will construct those projects. This happens to be a project that another designer did out of uh, Washington uh, out, out west. But this is for salmon habitat and the idea here was this is a bypass channel off the Sandy River and the idea here was to create this big massive wood log jam to slow the water down in this bypass system here and create salmon habitat. And the only way we could get logs, this is on a big uh, sits down in a valley, the only way we could get logs down here to build this massive log jam, and I'll show you in a minute, it's an all completely engineered log jam in here, is to helicopter in all the logs. So we had to hire a company to come in here that usually fights fires, um, but in this case to move logs in, down into our work area so we could use those logs down there because there was no way to truck them in to get them down there. Um, so we had the, the news stations out there. They were, they were filming all this. It was, it was quite a fun project. But this whole system here is these logs are, are buried in, and it's like tinker toys. We're actually building these, these columns, and then we're layering in logs. We're drilling in rebar to fasten them all to one another because, again, they don't want this system to move under flood events. They want it to stay stationary there. And we're replicating sort of the natural log jams that used to occur on these river systems that salmon um, love. And so we went in there, you can see sort of it being built, we started in this hole and built this whole log jam coming out of this hole, because the idea too is if the river begins to scour, you still have these logs a good 10 to 12 feet down. Um, but it took us a whole summer to build this. And this is what's left on top, so when you look at it, it looks like somebody just piled a whole bunch of logs there. Um, but again, they're all fastened to one another and they're all engineered um, in there. And then this was during a high flow event where that bypass channel was activated and all the flows coming through here and it flows right through and over top are, um, this log jam. And again, it's great salmon uh, habitat for salmon to hide and, and to rest and, and um, uh, yeah, um, move through there. So that's a, that's a lot of fun. And then I didn't have time to go through the <laughs> urban ecology framework with you all. So um, I don't know if you want me to just quickly run through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So urban ecology, right? You get all that. Um, so we've been working in Baltimore, Kansas City, uh, and now Atlanta doing an urban ecology framework for the city of Atlanta, which has been fantastic. You know, they have a commissioner there, Commissioner Tim Keene, who's really proactive about the whole idea of sort of designing, being intentional on how Atlanta is going to grow by sort of designing their way out of the mess that they're in now to a city that, you know, is vibrant, that thrives in the future. And so they created this whole process called city design where they lo really looked at how could they become this sort of beloved community based on um, uh, um, King's legacy here, right? And the idea that not changing is an option. Atlanta is going to change. And how do we do that? And so they came up with these five themes, equity, progress, ambition, access, and nature was their fifth theme. And after they did city design, they said, we need to go back and figure out what do we mean by nature? How do we, how do we embed and fuse nature within the city of Atlanta? So they ended up, um, this is what city design looks like in terms of where they want to concentrate growth on these sort of ridges and finger, fingers. And then they call these green areas conservation areas, which is a little bit of a misnomer because all these green areas are all housing and industry and development now. But the idea is how can you look at the city from a landscape ecology perspective? In this case, we kind of came up with three themes. How could you look at it from a science place-based perspective? You know, all the science in the world is great, great but it has to be really anchored in place. Um, we, we, we thought about a city as this sort of intricately layered um, entity, and that holds true for nature as it does for the cultural, social, and economic aspects of a city. So how is it connected to the Chattahoochee River, the South River, 
um, the Piedmont forest. And we also began looking at it from an equity standpoint in terms of this being inclusive that people have to understand. We want people to understand what's going on from a nature standpoint here. And it has to be adaptive because as soon as we finish the design, it's going to be out of date. And how, do we, how, do, how does this move forward? And of course, the number one key, as, key asset, ecological asset for the city is trees, right? It has the, has the highest tree canopy of any city in the United States. Atlanta does. And so trees are really critically important. So how do we use that um, and leverage that to our advantage? And we all know how important trees are in terms of the different ecosystem uh, processes. So one of the things that we did was just said, OK, well, we're going to look at habitat and biodiversity. We're going to look at ecosystem services. We're going to look at parks and open space. And we're going to look at environmental and climate justice issues. And that's going to be the underpinning of this ecological framework that we're doing. And then we unpack some of these. Well, what do we mean by habitat and biodiversity? You know, we're looking at naturalness. We're looking at patch size, pattern, species richness. And we did this for all these categories. I won't go over all of them, um, but we did it for all of them. We began looking at regionally what, you know, where the city is, right? It's on the um, uh, Eastern Continental Divide, which is interesting if you think about it, um, where three quarters of the city drains to the Gulf of Mexico and the other quarter of the city drains to the Atlantic Ocean. So that's interesting there. But we, again, we began mapping all this. So we mapped tree cover <coughs> canopy here. We looked at connectivity where these different systems are connected. We looked at this idea of interior forest and there are some interior forests left within the city boundaries. Where do they occur in the city? Um, we looked at combining all that into this habitat and biodiversity value matrix to say in the city where is the highest habitat and biodiversity. And you can imagine in the urban core there's very little, but in some of these outlying areas there's more of that there. We also looked at um, biodiversity. We, we ran what is called circuit skate, which is a model that you can run that basically models how species might move across the landscape. And it's usually done for vast areas and more natural areas. But we went in and worked to um, uh, change it a bit to run in an urban area. And I think this map here, this sort of heat map over here is really interesting because, because it really shows uh, a strong east or sort of northwest um, to southeast connection across the city that if planned right over the next 50 years, you could make a habitat corridor from the Chattahoochee River over the ridge to the South River here, which is really interesting to begin thinking about for the city of Atlanta. That could be a really big move that the city could make over the course of the next 50 years to highlight that. The brown areas are, are pretty desolate in terms of biodiversity and ecological connectivity, but that's the core running up through Buckhead and to the north there, right? Um, a little bit of Peach Tree Creek, which is sort of where that thins out a little there. And you can make a case that that could be a corridor, too, as well. Um, but we also began looking at social vulnerability and ecological connectivity and how the two might meet here in terms of open space, in terms of air pollution, floodplains, um, food deserts. And we began mapping that as well um, on here. Did a lot of community engagement. And that community engagement, we created these sort of heat maps based on all the feedback we got from the community of where there are ecological needs and where there are threats or risks to um, ecological systems. Again, not too surprising that that main spine of brown running through there is through the core of the city and up the interstates. But then thinking about combining social vulnerability and connecting people with nature and connecting nature with nature, what would that sort of look like if you overlaid that on Atlanta based on the existing attributes that are out there now. So we're still in the process of doing this. We're still working with the city planning to come up with the final um, framework for them. But it's really been interesting to kind of think through this whole thing where we've come up with these future scenarios of if you combine equity and access, what would it look like? If you just concentrated on landscape ecology, how would you maximize the landscape ecology aspects of the city? If you combine landscape ecology with equity, then what would that look like? Um, and then finally, if you threw in a whole layer of living infrastructure over top of that. So you can imagine how layered this all could become and how intertwined it could become with the ecology of the area if we can 
develop this in a way that we can embed it in future zoning, land use planning, development regulations, policy initiatives, that sort of thing. So it's pretty exciting to be thinking about this. And I will say the city of Atlanta is really one of the first cities, a lot of cities have done greenway planning, and we've been involved in some of that, but I haven't seen a city yet really take this comprehensive approach to how to embed ecology back into, or ecological systems back into a, a city here, so. All right, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.